nervous every time I stand in front of a, of a room, so just, just bear with me. <laughs> so my story begins, um, actually you're, you, this is like the most perfect, perfect timing because it begins actually now, 12 years ago. Um, and just to start off, just to lead in, I I'm going to give you a little bit of a mushal. There was once a pretzel vendor, you know the guy in the city who has his cart on a, on a street corner and in the cold winter days like today you see the steam coming off his cart and he sells pretzels. So he's been doing this for years, this is his job, this is his livelihood. And one day, out of the blue, this man, a stranger, walks over to his cart and asks him, excuse me sir, how much is a pretzel? And he says it's 25 cents. So the man takes out the uh, quarter plunks it down on the table, and then walks away. And the vendor says, wait a second, you forgot your pretzel. And the guy doesn't even turn around. He's like, wait, 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 hold on a second, you forgot your pretzel. And the guy doesn't even flinch, doesn't even look back, pretends not even to notice him. So he wants to run like, away from his cart to run after the guy, but he can't, and he's stuck, and he's like, but you forgot your pretzel. And the man never turns around, and he says, that is the strangest thing. And he comes home and he tells his wife about it. The strangest thing happened today. This guy paid me and didn't even take his pretzel. And then guess what? The next day, it happened again. The same guy comes over to his cart and says, Hi, how much is a pretzel? And he says, It's 25 cents. <laughs> and the man puts down 25 cents and walks away. And he's like, You forgot your pretzel! Again! And he's like, Just doesn't even turn around, doesn't, doesn't even acknowledge him. And the thing starts happening every single day. Every day, this guy walks up after, after a certain amount of time after a week, two, a month, I don't know, he stops asking. He just comes over, takes out the 25 cents, puts it on the table, and walks away. And after a while, the pretzel vendor just accepted this guy is a nutcase. You know, I'm not going to run after him, I'm not going to give him the pretzel, whatever, I, I'm used to it. And he starts just taking it for granted. And every morning, the guy walks over to him, good morning, gives him the 25 cents, and walks away. This goes on for a couple of years. Let's say 16 years. And... After 16 years, one day, the guy walks over, hands down the 25 cents, and the vendor, after not having said anything for years, says, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. And again, we know the man is not even turning around at this point, and he just keeps walking. And this time, the pretzel vendor leaves his cart, chases him down the street, runs after him, block after block, till finally he grabs onto the back of his coat, and he says, wait, hold on. And the man finally turns around, and he says, haven't you gotten the point? I don't need your pretzel. It's fine. Like, like, that's, like why, why are you chasing me now? He says, that's not why I'm here. I came to tell you the price went up. It's 35 cents. Okay? And I know this sounds really, really funny, except it's not. Because this, this, this is what happened to me. For 16 years, I had the most wonderful life. It was given to me on a silver platter for free. Hashem walked over to me, not walked over, just smiled down upon me every single day and said, here, have a blessed day. And I just took it for granted. I just was a regular kid, you know? I, I did what all kids do. I had a wonderful, regular life. Um, and like all kids, I, I complained a lot, you know? Because having a regular, wonderful life means you kind of take it for granted. You don't even realize how regular and wonderful it is. And then, you know, things happen. You go to school and you have a hard day and the teacher yells at you or you forgot your homework or you had too much homework or there was politics and some kid says something, something horrible to you and you come home and you're like, Ma, you don't even know what happened today. And you're like this. And, and so that's the kind of kid I was. Um, just normal, everyday, regular teenager. Think about your daughters, think about your friends, think about who you were as a, 12, as a, as a high school kid. And, and that's really who I was. Um, and I, and I, really, like, I really did take it for granted. I really was the pretzel vendor. I really, looking back, just, just took, took a lot. Took, took whatever was given to me and, and forgot that I wasn't really giving anything back. That, Whatever Hashem was given to, giving to me, it wasn't because I deserved it. It wasn't because I was giving him, it was an even exchange. It was because Hashem loved me. He was giving me a gift. And I, and I just didn't notice that. In fact, so I have this friend, her name is Mary, and we had a game um, we used to play. She didn't go to my school. She was a really close friend of mine, but we, we knew each other from camp, so we, we, hadn't been, we weren't in the same school. But we spoke to each other every single night, and we had a game. It was called the Kvetch game. And this is how we played. There were two rules. Um, one, you couldn't repeat a Kvetch 
that you had said before, or someone had said. So if she said, my mother was mean, I couldn't say my mother was mean. Um, and then the second rule is you have to keep it going. And if you, if you didn't, you were out. So we used to play the fetch game every single night, telling each other about our days. And it would go like this, like, you know, my brother woke me up at some ungodly hour. Great. Well, I had to go to detention today. She's like, oh yeah, well, I had to go to detention all week. And I'm like, well, I missed detention today, so I have to sit it tomorrow. And then, you know, and then she would be like, yeah, well, well, you know, um, um, I'm, I have detention for the next month, and I'll be like, yeah, well, I got kicked out of detention, so I have like double detentions for the next month. And we were going on and on and on about this, and we, we, we were able to play this probably on average every night for about three hours. We were really good at the game. Um, and, and that was really my life. Um, but, but I didn't even get to tell you that there was a lot of good in my life, too. Um, I was in a great school. I really, really loved my school. I had friends. I was popular. Um, I was the kind of kid who we had like 130 girls in my grade and I knew all their names because I just really liked people. I liked being around them. Um, I didn't try too hard at school because um, I didn't want to, but I didn't need to. So I was just lucky that way. I really had one of those all round regular good lives. Until one day, two weeks after Sukkot, um, we were, you know, just getting back into schedule, back on our regular routine. And it really, like, for, if you're in high school or if you're in any type of school, that's when your year starts. I mean, anyone, right? In the Jewish world, right? Summer, everyone comes home, and then you're, like, that mad rush before school starts, and then you have, like, like a month of Yom Tiv, and then finally after Sukkot, that's when you have that long stretch, and you're like, okay, this is winter, this is schedule, this is when the kids go to bed on time, and that's when the year is starting. And I remember it was first period. We had just finished math, and yeah, because we didn't have like Hebrew or English parts to our day. So it was like you could have math and then Parsha and then English and then Yahada. So we had finished math and I bent down under my desk to get my sitter and my neck hurt. So the first thing you do when something hurts you is you, you reach up and touch it. So, so I did. It was right here. And I, I touched my neck and it was, it was odd. It, it, didn't feel, it didn't feel okay. It felt hard. Like there was something there. Now, stop for a second and touch your neck. Really, I'm serious. Touch your neck. Because I get calls from doctors who say, you know how many teenage kids walking in because they read your book and they think there's something wrong with it? So seriously, touch your neck right now and if you have any questions, you know, I'll feel your neck and I'll tell you. You know, your neck is supposed to be bumpy. It's okay. There, there are lumps there. There are glands. There are, you know, there's stuff. There's a thyroid. There's a voice box. There's stuff going on there. It's supposed to feel bumpy. But when you, when you kind of stick your fingers into your neck, you can feel it give way. Whatever bumps you have going on there, they move and, and you can, you know, you can press them. What I felt was right over here, it was like between my neck and my shoulder, and it was quite large, and it didn't move, and it didn't press. Like if I was pressing on it, it felt like I was pressing on a piece of wood. And I said, that's odd. And it was quite large, like so, it was large enough that I thought, how did I get dressed this morning and not see that in the mirror? And so I started touching all around my neck, and then the strangest thing, I felt one here, and I felt two here actually, there were two, and then I felt one more over here, and I said, I must be imagining things. This is so weird, you don't just, all of a sudden have bumps in your neck. So I, I tapped the girl in front of me, her name was Miriam, um, and I said, Miriam, your mother's a nurse, right? And she said, yeah. Um, I said, great, do you mind touching my neck? <laughs> and she says, no, I'm not touching your neck, ew. I said, no, but your mother's a nurse and, and I need help. I think something's wrong with me. Can you, can you please touch my neck and tell me if there's something going on? And she's like, girl, I am not touching your neck. I said, please. Just touch my neck. So she sticks out this finger and she like, <laughs> she pokes my neck and she's like, ah, there's something in your neck. And then she's like, everyone touch her neck. There's something there. So then we had 30 girls like, really? Can I touch it? Can I touch it? And, we, and the teacher's like, girls, quiet down and start down. And then everyone starts quiet. And, quiet. and then we all um, finished davening. And um, after class, so Miriam comes over to me and she says, um, so are you going to call your mother? I said, no, why should I call my mother? She says, you have a bump in your neck. I said, yeah, we established that, so. So she said, so my mother's a nurse. I said, oh, really? Now your mother's a nurse? Now you're good with that? She's like, yeah, my mother's a nurse, and if you have a bump in your neck, I think you should call somebody. I said, really? My mother's not a nurse. She doesn't know what to do with the bump in the neck. I think it's fine. She's like, no, I think you should call your mother. So I said, okay. So I, I go downstairs, because in those days, nobody had cell phones, and there was a pay phone in my school, and I, I would have gone to the, to, the print, to the office, but they wouldn't have allowed me to call my mother, because they knew me too well. Like, I, I, I was in that office a lot, so. Um, <laughs> I um, went down to the payphone, and it's funny because I've been back in that school. I actually teach in the school sometimes, and the payphone is still there. It doesn't even work. The girls don't even know how to use it. They're like, what is that thing? How do you use that thing? And I'm like, I use that phone, that one. <laughs> so um, I, I dialed my parents, and my parents, this is the way they are, so they see the school's um, number come up on the caller ID, and uh, my mother picks up, and she, she doesn't even ask who it is. She's like, you're not going home. 
And I said, hello? And she says, you're not going home. I said, you don't even know what I want. She says, who is this? Because I had another sister at school. And I tell her, no, it's me, it's Tippy. She's like, no, Tippy, you're not going home. I said, do you want to hear me out? Do you want to hear what I need? She's like, okay, what's going on? I'm like, mommy, I need to go home. And she, she's like, why? I said, because I have a bump in my neck. And she says, no, you don't. I said, no, no, mommy, yes, I do. Um, 30 girls established that. She's like, no, you don't have a bump in your neck. I said, mommy, I had the same neck for 16 years. I think I would know if there was a bump in it. And she says, what do you want me to do about it? I said, I don't know, can I go home? And she says, um, you know what, Dr. Rosenberg, is his office is around the corner from your school. If I, if I let you go out of school early, you're gonna have to go to Dr. Rosenberg. And I was like, myself? You know, once if he gives me a shot? I was really mature. So, uh, um, so, I, um, I, so, so I, I said, you know what, okay. I'll, I'll do it. And she was like, wow, you really were serious. Like, she thought I was calling because I had chemistry next. But, you know, I really, I was calling because I did have this problem. So I left the school, and I come over to the doctor, and he, he sees me, and he's like, let me guess, you have chemistry. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no, but really, I'm here that, because I have a bump in my neck. He's like, no, no, it's a good one, but I'll just write you a note. I'm like, no, no, seriously, Dr. Rosenberg, I have a bump in my neck. He totally didn't believe me because he has seen me so often when I had math, chemistry, chumash, you know. So I was like, no, no, seriously, I have a bump in my neck. He's like, if you say so. And so he starts writing me a note. I'm like, no, I, I have a bump in my neck. And he's like, what do you want me to do about it? I'm like, you're my doctor. Can you look at it? I was like, oh, you're serious. I said, yeah, I'm serious. So he, so he checks me out and he says, oh, yeah, there is a bump in your neck. All right, um, go home and uh, I'll call your mother. So um, I'm really happy because my day just ended so nicely. I got to go home early. And um, I totally forgot about the bumps in my neck because there's just a bump in my neck, right? But when he called... It didn't hurt. No, it didn't hurt. It hurt at the time when I like bent down and there was like a twinge. I felt something, and so I touched it, but it didn't actually hurt. Um, but my my joy was was a little bit short lived, because Dr. Rosenberg called my mother and suggested that we go to an ENT. So we went to an ENT, which was like another joy, another missed day of school. Psh, amazing. So we went to that ENT and the ENT checked me out and then she suggested that we go get some blood tests, which was not such a joy. And then after the blood test we were suggested to go to a CAT scan, which was also, you know, half day of school. Amazing. And we were kind of being pushed around from one doctor to the other until one doctor we ended up with was a hematologist. Um, a hematologist is a doctor that looks into blood disorders and I missed another day of school to go to him. And he, he does all my scans, he looks at my bloods, he, he checks everything out, and he says, all right. So he comes in with his intern, and they're both like all serious looking. And this intern probably today is younger than I am, right? Because like he was still in college and he's training to become a doctor and he's looking like all nervous. And they tell me, the doctor tells me, okay, so I have some news. And I said, okay. And he says, you have something called Hodgkin's. And I said, okay. He says, do you know what Hodgkin's is? I said, no. He says, um, Hodgkin's is a type of lymphoma. And I said, okay. He says, do you know what lymphoma is? And I said, no, not really. So he says, he's like pacing by now. He's like, lymphoma, it's a type of cancer. And I said, okay. And he says, do you know what cancer is? I said, yeah, I I'm not stupid. <laughs> And, and my mother like burst into tears, you know, she was like, and I, I was just like, um, yeah, okay, fine, great, no, no problem. So, so the intern, I remember this very vividly, so he looks at me, he must have been like really new at this, so he tells me, the doctor just told you that you have like a terminal illness, um, and you look like school was canceled. I said, well, well it was, right? <laughs> and, and he thought I was nuts, he told the doctor, you think something's wrong in her neck, you should check out her head. So, you know, of course, I was probably in shock at the time, and uh, later that night, Later that night, it was a very exhausting day, I remember, because it was just a day, like, the minute he gave me a diagnosis, he, I, we needed to schedule a, another surgery, and, and immediately, like, um, you know, just tons and tons, he, he gave me, um, well, he didn't actually give me a diagnosis, it wasn't, he just thought it was that, he didn't know for sure, and he said, scheduled me for, like, another surgery, uh, a biopsy to just cut open uh, my neck and, and take a little piece out of it so they can test it, and, um, 
So from him, we had to run and schedule the surgery. And like, I remember by the time we got home, it was like 9.30 and I was exhausted. And, and I remember like just breaking down at one point and crying and saying like, I, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And, and like being overwhelmed. But then, you know, for the next two days, I didn't say anything because... It wasn't an official diagnosis. So this is what I think you have, but it's not like 100% um, you know, sure till we get the, the biopsy. So I went back to school, I remember, didn't say anything, left again one day to have my biopsy, and then we were supposed to get the results on a Monday. Um, I had my biopsy on a Friday, and I was supposed to get like my preliminary results. The results were supposed to be on Wednesday, but by Monday they should have known something. So Monday I come to school like a regular day. I'll never forget this, this was awesome. So we had computers, and um, I'm in the computer room. Oh no, so before computers, it was like recess time or lunch time, I called my mother, and I asked her, so did we get the results yet? And she says, yeah, we got the results, and it's um, it's confirmed, you know, that's what you have and we're going to be starting. She's like, it's not even preliminary, it was so, they saw it so clearly, you're going to be starting chemotherapy on Wednesday. I was like, oh, okay. So then I went to computers and um, I'm sitting in class and I'm like typing and doing my thing. And so Miriam, that Miriam, so she was sitting next to me during computers, so she, she comes over, to, she like, like, she's like, Psst. whatever happened with that bump in your neck? Um, did you ever like do anything about it? I said, yeah, actually, it's so funny that you ask. So, so I have cancer. And she was like, because she was in the middle of class. And she couldn't do anything. And she was like, Aah! like a silent scream. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> and we just continue typing. So then after, after that lesson, um, you know, I come down from the computer room all the way to my classroom and I hear screams. There's like screaming and crying in the hallway and people are like sobbing on the floor. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what happened? And this girl is like, she's on the floor. She's seriously, she's sitting on the floor. She's like leaning against the wall and she's like, ah! And I'm like, what happened? She says, this girl in our grade, she has a brain tumor. And I'm like, that's terrible. Like, like I'm, I'm going through my thing, but like, to me, it's like it's a blood disorder. Like, there's a brain tumor, that's terrible. I'm like, who? She's like, you. I'm like, that was it. I was like, called my mother. I'm like, mommy, I am done. I am coming home. So yeah. So that, so, so, yeah, so, so my life kind of like turned over from one minute to the next. And, and, um, and I started chemo. And, and I don't really think I need to tell you what chemo is like. It's, it's pretty awful. Um, you know, unfortunately today, everybody knows somebody who's been through something like this. Chemotherapy is, is it doesn't need to be explained. Um, but what people don't know is that there's a lot more to being sick than just the nausea and the hair loss. Um, the nausea was fairly awful itself, but then people don't even tell you that the times when you're not nauseous, I had no appetite. I remember like walking into the kitchen and saying, you know, I haven't eaten for like three days and I don't feel hungry. And people would just come over and buy me ice cream and milkshakes and I'd be like, I don't even want that. It, it was like, it was such an odd feeling. I did not feel hungry. It was like either I was nauseous or I just didn't even want to eat. Then people tell you about the hair loss. And I, I kind of knew that, like right at the beginning. I knew I was going to lose my hair. Um, I think that was, I was the most prepared for it, which is funny because as a kid, I used to read the Chicken Soup for the Soul books. They're still around, right? You know them? Yeah. So, so there used to be stories um, that I would read about kids who had alopecia and they would like lose their hair suddenly. And I remember thinking like, that is my nightmare. That is my nightmare. Imagine have to go, having to go to school without hair. And then like all of a sudden I hear I have cancer. I'm like, wow, that just, that's like a dream come true. So like that was the, one of the first things that I dealt with, knowing that I'm going to lose my hair. So I went out and I got a shaitel and I, and, I, and I did all my preparations. And you know, it's one thing to get a shaitel when you're, when you're married and you're, or you're engaged and you're like, I'm so excited and I'm like, this is so pretty and it matches my hair color and I love the texture and the cut and the whatever. It's another thing when I, I'm not getting married. I have my hair, I have beautiful hair and you put on a wig and you look like you're wearing a wig. I mean, we have beautiful, beautiful wigs. I, you know, you've seen women with these like $3,000 wigs and they look amazing, but it's still a wig. And I was 16 and I didn't want to wear a wig. And I remember being there at the Schadelmacher and just, looking at myself in the mirror and really not looking like myself. And, and then when my hair started falling out, you know, for, for, for a girl, especially a teenage girl, hair is everything. You know, I remember coming home from school and jumping into the shower like at 5 p.m. so that my hair would be dry enough at 6 p.m. so that I can start blowing it or ironing it or styling it. And heaven forbid that I woke up in the morning and it was raining because like I, I'm not going to school if it's raining because if it's raining and I come to school and my hair is frizzy, then like two hours of work just went down the drain. There's so much time devoted to our hair when we're 
you know, teenagers, you know, grown-ups, we spend time on it. It's our beauty. It's what, it's, it's, we take pride in it. And losing it was, heart, like, heartbreaking. Um, and, you know, I, I just kind of knew, okay, fine, I'm going to have here, and then I'm going to be bold. No one prepared me for what it would be like to actually lose it. And it didn't just happen overnight. So I was in the hospital um, after my first round of chemo, and I was feeling really bad, um, mostly because I needed a blood transfusion, which no one prepared me for either. Like, just watching someone else's blood just go into me, it's like, ew. I remember crying about it the first time. I was like, I don't want someone else's blood. That's horrible. And I just felt so bad, and I was just crying and crying and crying. And then they gave me the blood. They kind of forced... You know, I didn't have a choice. They, they forced me to have the blood. And then I felt amazing after I had the blood. It was like, wow, I felt like a new person. So from then on, I started asking for blood. Like, every time I felt sick, I was like, can I have blood today? So I became like a little vampire. I used to come in and like, blood, yes! You know, but I remember that time before I had my first ever transfusion. I was feeling miserable because my hemoglobin levels were so low, and I was just so sad. And, I, and they told me that I had to stay in the um, hospital over Shabbos, which was, to me, it was like devastating because I had been there all week, and I just wanted to go home. And... Um, I remember the doctor, it wasn't my doctor, it was just the doctor on call, and she told me, and I was like moping, I was like curled up in a chair or something, and I was crying, and she told me, you don't have to cry, you don't have to be upset, um, you know, because cause there, there are perks to having cancer. I was like, really? Name them. So she's like, you know, make a wish foundation. So they're going to come and they're going to ask you what you want. Like, you want a trip to Disney World or something? Like, they're going to give you something amazing. Whatever you ask for, they're going to make your dream come true. I'm like, I want an Uzi. And she's like, a what? I said, a rifle. So she says, um, why? So she says, I said, well, because if I had an Uzi, you wouldn't make me stay here over Jabez. So she tells me, yeah, I don't think that they're going to give a 16-year-old with your attitude an Uzi. I said, you know what? It's fine. If I were in charge, I wouldn't have given someone with your bedside manner a license to practice medicine. And we were like even, you know. So, but yes, yeah, so I got the stuff. I had to stay. So I remember like taking a shower and coming out of the shower and trying to pull my hair back into a ponytail and it wouldn't go. You know when you pull your hair back and it kind of like there's a resistance. It lays flat because you're pulling on something. It didn't. It was like not laying flat and, and strands were just coming, coming away in my hand. And every time I brushed, it was like big clumps. There was still hair in my head. It wasn't like all of a sudden I woke up bald, but it was like if I, if I pulled this, it just came out. Um, and I remember like just experimenting with it. First I cried. I cried my heart out. I was like, that's horrible. And I don't want to lose my hair. I think that was like probably the first time I just really broke down crying. Um, you know, because in the beginning, it's, it was very disorienting going through that process. Like, things happen so fast, things move so fast, and you don't even know what you're doing. You're being pushed from doctor to doctor and scan to scan, and therapy and chemo, and you're like, you don't even know what's happening. And, like, that's when it hit me, when my hair started coming out. And I remember um, coming home around, like, after Shabbos, maybe Sunday, um, and I, I have a three-year-old, I had a three-year-old sister at the time. She's, she's old enough to be babysitting for me right now, but at the time, she was three. And I, I went over to her like this, and I said, um, here, hold this for a second. So she held on to it, and then I walked away, and she was like, can you do it again? <laughs> so we did it like, you know, ten times, and, and we had fun with that for a day, and after a day, it was pretty disgusting. Like, you know, the hair was just coming out, and I said, you know what, let's have fun. So my mother went out, I think she went to the grocery, and while she was gone, I took a shaver, and I gave it to my brothers, and I said, you know how you always hated when, like, we cut your hair because you had an upshare, and we made you pay us, and I was always, like, the big sister, going, Bzzz. I was like, want to do it to me? And they were like, yes! So we had an upshare, and then my mother came home, and I think she had this, like, moment of shock, and then she was like, okay, let's make, like, cupcakes and pekalach, because, like, we're having an upshare. So my family was, like, amazing during this time. We just decided that we're totally going to own this, and I really did. It was right from the beginning when I got sick and people had this reaction towards me, if you remember, they were screaming in the hallways, and I, I felt like, wait, wait, like, I'm still myself. I'm going through something and it's very difficult, but I'm still the girl that sat next to you in class, I'm still the person that went on the Shabbat home with you, and I'm still the person who tutored you in uh, science last week. And all of a sudden I was like, um, getting people going over to me like, hi, how are you? And I'm like, I have cancer, I'm not deaf. You know, or like, you know, they, they were treating me very, very differently. Um, just to give you an example, in the two weeks from when I found my bumps to when I was finally diagnosed, it took two weeks of tests and scans because nobody wants to say cancer first. First, they, they, they test you for everything else. Cancer is like the last thing they take you to. So for, it took two weeks to get the, that um, diagnosis. In the two weeks, 
that I had been in and out of school, like missing half days here, early, leaving early there, um, nobody called. 30 girls in the class and nobody called me to ask me what was going on, what was happening in my life. Um, it was fine, you know, they're busy and, and I was busy and I didn't really need to share all that with everybody. But the day that my diagnosis happened, I got 40 calls in one night. It was like the point that we just took the phone off the hook because we just couldn't deal with it. And I remember thinking like, what, what changed, what changed? Yesterday, you didn't call me, but now that I have a diagnosis, like everyone was treating me differently. Now they wanted to talk to me. Now they wanted to call me. Girls I didn't even know. Girls I, like I never spoke to two words before. Now they wanted to be my best friends. And I was like, no, no, I am going to own this. No one is going to tell me how to be sick and no one's going to get away with treating me differently. I am still myself and I'm just going to show everybody. So I decided to, um, really like take charge of my situation. And that's what I did. Like when my hair started falling out, I'm like, okay, my hair has to fall out. So be it. I'm going to take charge of this and we're going to do it my way. And we took a shaver and we shaved off my head. I took pictures of everything. Um, because when I was first diagnosed, there was no one to talk to. 12 years ago, no one said the word cancer and I, I didn't have any information. Nobody was there to tell me what I was about to go through. So, um, I did have one friend, um, she actually dove into my shul and she had the exact same cancer as me, but a year earlier. So I, I asked her, um, do you have her parents, she and her parents came to visit us to like give us chizuk and tell us like, you know, it's going to be okay. They showed her like she was healthy and she was fine and she was beautiful just to give us like a little bit of an idea that it's going to be fine. And I remember asking her, do you have any pictures of that time so that I can see like what it would look like, what I'm going to look like? And her father and her mother look at each other and they say, so those are six months that we erased from her life. We didn't take any pictures of her in those six months. And I was like, wait, like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not invisible. I'm not going to pretend this didn't happen to me. So like, we made a decision. My mother likes to scrapbook. So she was like everywhere with her camera. Like I fainted, snap. You know, she knew like the nurses are going to, she doesn't think she can do. The nurses are going to take care of me. So she was snapping pictures. Every single pill bottle I had, she like lined them up on the counter and she took pictures. Um, we took pictures of, of like everything, the needles that she had to give me, all the presents I got, um, my hospital mask. I'm going through my album, like, like page by page. All oh, my doctors, every single nurse, every single doctor, she took pictures of everything. And I kept journal because when I asked this girl to tell me details she's like I don't I don't know like I, like I'm back in school and I, I don't remember exactly which medications I took or like how I felt like it was a while back for her and I said how do you not know this is major this is like life-changing and she says because life goes on and and you forget and I'm like no she says yeah so I said no so I took a diary and I started writing in there every single night, even when I was really, really not feeling well, even when I was really sick, I would just make it like an effort to write two or three lines every night just to say, I'm going to remember, I'm going to keep track of this. Cause I said, if Hashem sends this to me, there must be a reason for it. And it would be pretty like, pretty awful if Hashem sent me this like six months of my life to do something major with. And I was kind of like, Oh, Oh, is that what I was supposed to do? I totally did not notice that. And I just missed it because I didn't want to remember it. So, so I, you know, we, we totally, me and my family, we took charge of the situation. We decided to own it, but it was still pretty, pretty horrible. So aside from the like nausea and the hair loss, which kind of people know, there were so many other things going on. I mean, no one told me that my fingertips and my toes were going to kind of going to become completely numb. I don't know why. I can't remember which medication it was that did it. See, I'm already forgetting. I can't remember which medication it was that did it to me, but I lost all sensation in my fingertips. It felt like my fingertips were coated in glue. So if I touched things, I was always walking around and kind of like, like touching things over and over because I didn't have any sensation. So I would go to like something like this, like a desk, and I would like, like bang my fingers because I was trying to feel something. I'm like, wow, this doesn't even hurt. And like everyone was like, oh, can you stop doing that? And I'm like, no, it's, it's like fine. Like it doesn't hurt. And it was really just, um, I learned how to play guitar then because you know how everyone complains about the calluses, you know, the first couple of months. And I'm like, yay, I can callus all I want. I don't feel anything. So I did that. So that was the nice part. But you know what people don't tell you? So when your feet, when your toes are numb, you know, when you go up and down stairs, you don't have to look where you place your foot because it's kind of like your body can sense where the next step is. You know, after step one and step two, your feet automatically just, just kind of go. And you can have a phone conversation while you're running upstairs. You can be singing a song. No one's looking at their feet when they're going upstairs. And I, because my toes were numb, I totally lost that sensation of where the next step is. And I was like an old lady. I had to hold onto the banister and really just like look where I was placing my feet. It was a crazy... It was like a crazy experience for me. No one told me that my skin was going to turn green. Um, I looked awful. I looked, I had these like two black eyes all the time because 
of whatever changes this chemotherapy was doing to my body. Um, I did not expect to lose as much weight as I did. I started already pretty thin. I started at like 105 pounds. After a month, I was at 87 pounds. I was just like emaciated and, and, and no one tells you what it's like to lose your friends. Um, not because they weren't my friends, not because my friends didn't stay my friends, but no one explained to me, like, yes, I knew I was going to be nauseous. I knew I was going to lose my hair. I didn't really realize what it would mean to just not go to school every day, to not kvetch to Miri on the phone every day about detention and teachers and homework. You know, I took it for granted, because most of us do, that work is work, school is school, life is life. And all of a sudden, the world went on without me. It was like, everyone told me, you have to stop, and they took me out of this world and put me somewhere else, in a hospital, but all my friends were still going to school every day, taking tests, talking, participating in the play, having fun, and life was moving without me. And that was really hard. No one told me those parts of cancer. No one told me that these things were were what I was going to deal with. Um, but I decided that, like I said, I can make myself happy. I, I'm still the same person inside. I like to laugh a lot. We're very humorous uh, people, my family. We're just maybe a little on the nutty side, like, you know, the shaving the hair kind of thing. Um, and I decided I'm, I'm still the same person inside. I like to laugh. Um, I like to have fun. So there's no reason I can't do that in the hospital. So I did. Um, I, I would like, I mean, you can tell the way I spoke to the doctor. I was like sarcastic and like on the ball. I named all my um, accessories. So like my headache, who was with me constantly, his name was David. My stomach ache was Louis. And my, my um, IV pole that was always with me, his name was Steve, because I know someone Steve was a real drip. And um, you know, <laughs> no offense Steve, but you know, I know a few Steves, but you know. And so we, we tried like, laughing at everything and, and, and poking fun at everything. Like when my head was bald, so um, I wore a yarmulke because why not? Because um, I may as well. And, and um, actually I remember opening the door to someone that I know very, very well right now. My husband actually. He thought I was a boy. Um, I met my husband when I was not well. Story I'll get into a little later. Um, but the first time he met me, he thought I was a boy because I opened the door in a yarmulke. But yeah, so we did all these like funny, weird, spunky stuff. I'm trying to remember um, what else. Oh yeah, so in my bald head. So um, I, I used to let my friends autograph my head. So they did because it was like so nice and, and shiny and, and pretty. And I'd be like, no, you can sign here. And I'd be like, get yeah, well soon. And then, you know, I'd, like, I would have to shower. So I showered and then we did it all again. It was very fun. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, we just... We just really, like, I remember um, at one point going back to school, it was like in the middle of one of my cycles, and because chemo's working, chemo works in cycles, it's like like three weeks on, a week off, that type of thing. So I remember having like a, a downtime where my immune system was good enough to go to school, so I went to school for a day, and they were doing um, speeches, public speaking, and I'm like, oh, I would love to do public speaking. So the teacher says, so it was a how-to speech, you had to teach the class how to do something, I'm like, got it. So I brought in a needle and a, a plum, or something, and I taught the class how to give an injection. It went over really well. Uh, you know, so we really just kind of like went with it, but then, um, and I made this decision mostly to be happy, because when I got sick, first of all, I, I did it for myself. Like, don't tell me, like, I can, I can kind of like do this, um, but, but really, I knew how hard it was gonna be for my parents and my siblings. I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest, and I was 16, so I wasn't a baby, and I had, I'm the oldest of nine, so there were a lot of little ones under me, and I, I just knew that it's really going to be up to me. The way my family sees it, the way my family deals with it, it's really going to be up to me. So, I mean, I've, I've seen people, I still see people who are deathly afraid of the word cancer. It's a scary word. In our family, it was just a word we said. It was like my three-year-old, like my three-year-old sister used to say, yeah, so she has cancer, it's fine. Like, it wasn't a scary word. It wasn't a scary anything. They, if I got presents, it was like everyone can share. I did it for them so that there was nothing to be afraid of, even though there were scary parts. But we took them in stride. This is a scary part, but it doesn't mean we can't laugh. But there was, I realized at one point that there's a difference between being funny and being happy. And so while we were expending so much effort being funny, I used to go to bed really sad sometimes 
you know, not just because I was hurting, just because life had changed so quickly and so unexpectedly and I didn't, I didn't even see my way out of it, you know. Like, I remember thinking at, at one point, so even when they tell me that I'm in remission and I'm okay, I, I don't even see myself going back to school, right? School didn't wait for me. They had continued on without me. So it was like going back to school and being like the new kid. I just, I, I felt like overwhelmed and, and not really sure we, where I stood. And I really didn't know how to be happy. And I remember feeling to myself like, yes, I can laugh. And I can laugh and laugh and laugh because life is funny. But funny isn't happy. And I remember feeling to myself, you know, I had an amazing life once. I really did. I went to school every day. I had friends, I had homework, I had tests, I passed tests, I failed tests, I don't know, it was just life, and it was busy, and it was hectic, and there was drama, and it was good, and I didn't know it. I didn't know it was good, right? I played a kvetch game. Until one day, um, halfway through, right in the middle of, I, I had actually four cycles of chemo, which in and of itself is a miracle, because the type of cancer that I had actually requires between six to eight set cycles of chemo, um, till today, this is what they do, but when I became sick, my doctor, not every doctor, my doctor was part of a team of doctors doing a study on patients with my type of cancer that they wanted to see if they can get away with giving higher doses of chemo, but in a shorter amount of time. And overall, if you add it all together, it would be less chemo overall. He says what they used to do is when someone got sick, they just bombed them with chemo. A year, two years, no problem, just bombed them with chemo. And after a while, they realized that not everybody needs so much chemo, and they, they develop better testing systems to see how far advanced the cancer got and if it was reacting to the chemotherapy. So they said every few years, they tried seeing if they can cut down the chemo even more and making it more fine-tuned and more precise, because why have more poison in your system than you really need to? Because chemo is a poison, let me tell you. So I, I agreed to be on the study, and so it was amazing. I only needed four cycles of chemotherapy instead of eight. So I remember at that, uh, at that point, I was halfway through. I had done my second cycle, and it was... A disaster. Um, chemo, chemo totally dehydrated me, and I know when you think of dehydration, you think of you know the summer, not drinking enough water, fainting, heat stroke. That's not what it is for me. Our bodies need water for for everything. I mean, right? They tell you drink your eight glasses a day, and you're going to have beautiful skin, and you're going to be healthy. Well, I didn't have enough water in my system, and so my body wasn't digesting food, and everything I ate even though I didn't really eat very much, everything I ate kind of got stuck there because there wasn't enough water in my system to just break down the food. So what happened to everything that I ate, it stayed there and it solidified, it became hard. So hard that if I pressed down on my abdomen, it was hard, it really hurt. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't move. I was, in, I was so uncomfortable. Um, and it built up to a point where after a couple of days, I remember being in so much pain, I walked into the bathroom and I passed out. I fainted on the floor of the bathroom, and of course this is like the most mortifying thing of the whole of the whole thing. Of course they had to like break down the door. My parents heard me fall, and they broke down the door, and Hatzala had to come, and they like flew me into the hospital, and they were going to do surgery on me, and um, actually you know relieve me of of what was stuck inside there. And at the end, Baruch Hashem, we they had some like really strong medication, and I a couple hours passed, painful hours, but I didn't need surgery in the end. And I remember like a week later, coming home from the hospital. From then on, they sent me home with a, a, a bag of fluid so that I shouldn't get dehydrated. I think that was like, also, it was like such a nightmare. That bag was also called something. I forgot. Yeah, so I had it with me everywhere, and it was like this big black briefcase, and there were like wires coming out, and then it was battery operated, so that battery would die like every three hours, and it would like beep, and then people would think I would have a bomb. Seriously, I was like in the store, and I was like waiting online, and this thing started beeping, and you see this kid taking off a big backpack with wires, and you're like, ah, you know, there's a wire, and it's beeping, and I'm like, no, it's not a bomb, and you open it up, and people see like big machines and like bags, and it's like, it's okay, you know, so that was like my life, and then like every three hours, you had to wake up to change the batteries, and a lot of fun, but. Anyway, I remember like a week later coming out of the bathroom and in my parents' house, right outside of the bathroom, they had this sign, you know that Asha gets our sign, the blue one, right? And it has all those nice pictures on the side, right? So I'm saying the bracha, which is a bracha that we say what, like five times a day, eight times a day since what, we're five or six years old. So I, I've been saying this bracha, I don't know, do the math, a lot of times over the years and I'm saying it now, standing outside of the bathroom and looking at this chart, I'm looking at the pictures because I would rather look at pictures if I, you know, between reading and looking at pictures, it's the pictures, always. So um, I'm saying there, you know, 
nekavim, nekavim, you know, cavities, chalalim, chalalim, and openings, and, or no, I had it opposite, yeah, openings and cavities, whatever, and, and you're like, you know, and, you know, if, if one of them were to get blocked, how would I continue to exist? You know, and the la mod and stand in front of you, even for one hour. If one of my cavities were to become blocked, I wouldn't be able to stand in front of you, Hashem, for even one hour. And I'm looking at the picture and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's so true. That's me. That's exactly what happened to me. I had a big cavity inside me, my stomach, my esophagus, whatever, and it got clogged. It was, it was blocked. And I couldn't stand. I literally fainted. I ended up on the floor. I said, I can't believe I have been saying this bracha my whole life, how many times a day, and I never realized how grateful I have to be stepping out of the bathroom that everything functioned properly and beautifully, is so properly and so beautifully that like the pretzel vendor, I took it for granted. I just accepted those 25 cents and went on with my day. And it was only when the price went up, when I had cancer, and things started happening and things didn't function so perfectly that I realized what I lost, what I once had, and I didn't have it anymore. And it was like it sat with me. You know, it, it really just kept going around my head that whole day, I remember. And so I decided pretty much then that I, I was going to make myself happy. Because I said, how could it be like I had so much to be happy for? I used to go to the bathroom just fine my whole life, all the time. And I never knew how happy I had to be that that was okay and working for me. And I said, and now that I don't have it, like, I should have been happy all along and I didn't even know that I should be. So I said, I, I made like a, like a, like a commitment, like almost like a Kabbalah. And I said, I'm going to try and find three things every single day to say thank you for, to be happy for. Because Hashem does so much for me every single day. So, so let me notice them. Let me see what he's doing for me before they get taken away and I realize what I had, but I didn't realize what I had until it got taken away. And so I started saying thank you. And, and not for the big things, because the big things are easy to say thank you for. You know, when someone gives you a big gift or an expensive piece of jewelry, of course you're going to say thank you so much. That's so nice of you. You didn't have to. But it's like the small things that you take for granted. Like when my mother puts supper on the table. I never told my mother, thank you for supper. What do you mean? You come home from school and you get supper. It's on the table. All of a sudden, I realized, no, you know something? There's effort that gets put into that supper. I should say something. I should say thank you. Or I'll drive and the light turns green and I don't have to wait there. And I'm like, thank you, Hashem, the light turned green. I'm in a rush. You know, 45 seconds less that I have to wait. Uh, just little things. I started looking for little things. I had a nice nurse. She was nice to me. She wasn't one of those like angry, like be quiet and just like do your thing. You know, one of those, how are you feeling today? And anything I can get you or give me a little stuffed teddy bear. Thank you. Thank you for everything. And I realized that when I started looking for things to say thank you for, there were so many. I couldn't stop at only three. There were just so many. Every single second there was just something else to be grateful for. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It was, it was life changing. It was beautiful. Um, and I think that was for me the difference between being funny and being humorous and being happy. And people um, read my book and they, they tell me, I get uh, teenagers all the time because they read my book and then they think they're going to get a lot of points for doing like school reports on it. So I get a lot of teenagers who do that. And they call me up and they think they're going to interview me and get like some amazing answers. And they tell me, how did you stay so like funny? during your, your, your whole ordeal, because if, I don't know if you've read the book, but the book is pretty funny. I think people feel guilty when they read the book, because it's like about cancer, and then you end up laughing a lot, and you're like, I shouldn't laugh, because the girl had cancer. And I'm like, no, it's okay, you're supposed to laugh. Um, also, just warning, if you haven't read the book, and you're planning to read the book, don't read it at bedtime, because, because it'll keep you up. Um, not because it's scary, just because the chapters are really short, um, and then you're going to say, okay, one more. No, no, just one more. Because each chapter is like literally a page, because it's my diary, it's just a page, it's like a day, and what happened that day, you're like, just one more just one more, just one more. And then they call me up complaining. I was up till three o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I should put a disclaimer. So here's my disclaimer, you know, don't read it tonight. But uh, unless you're okay with staying up till three o'clock in the morning. Um, but people ask me, how did you stay so funny? And I tell them, funny? Funny is not hard. Knock, knock, who's there? You know, I, I can tell you a joke anytime. There's always stuff to joke about. Being happy. That's the difference. That's the secret. Some people are just funny people by nature. You don't get, you don't take that away from a person, but you can be funny and really be sad inside, which I was. 
You know, I would make everybody else laugh. I would go to school and tell everybody, it's okay, would you like to sign my head? And then I would come home and cry about being bald. Funny and happy are not the same thing. It's like, one is just like, I don't know, a talent that's just given to you. It's like from Hashem, right? He gave me the talent to be funny. And one is a skill, something I had to actually work on. And happiness was a skill. It was something I had to learn. So since then, I made it a commitment that I'm going to find things to be thankful for. And when you're so busy saying thankful, saying thank you all day, there's no such thing I discovered as having a bad day. You can have bad moments, you can have bad times, but there's no such a thing as going to sleep with a bad day. I, I, I'm th trying to think back now saying it, it's Baruch Hashem, it's 12 years. I don't think I've ever gone to sleep thinking that today was a bad day. Because I do this throughout the day. I try to say thank you as many times as I can throughout the day to, to Hashem and to everybody. I mean, obviously, if, if Hashem doesn't need my thank you, I do it for me. I tell him thank you for me because it makes it, it changes my life. But people need your thank you. So I make an effort, of course, to compliment people and say thank you to people and notice them and notice like all the things around me. You know, like like compliments are also a way of saying thank you. It's like when you go to a wedding and someone's wearing something beautiful, they put effort into that. So you say, wow, you look beautiful. I love your pin. They chose that pin. They didn't just pick any random dress out of the closet. They chose to put on that pin. So it's like an acknowledgement. That's what a thank you is. It's an acknowledgement. I acknowledge that you took the time to get dressed and pretty today. I acknowledge that Hashem, I woke up today and I can breathe, right? You know how many people have allergies and you wait for that moment, like sometime like in April and you can't breathe, your nose is stuffed. You're like, ah, where's my Claritin? And they're like, oh my gosh, Asha, please, why today I have to give a report and my nose is stuffed? But like yesterday when your nose was fine, did you say, Thank you. No, we don't do that. So it's an acknowledgement when I can do that. When I say, wow, thank you, Hashem, for that nice deep breath, it's an acknowledgement. There was something done for me. And there's no way to go to sleep unhappy. So at night, I do this during the day, but at night, right before I go to bed, I just try. And the last thing I do before I go to bed, I just say, thank you, Hashem, for three things. And, and my rule is, I'm not so good about keeping this rule, but my rule is that they can't be big things. So I have three kids, can I hear and it's very easy to say thank you Hashem for kid one, kid two, and kid three. Um, but that's not, you know, that doesn't count because that's the easy thing. So sometimes I do it when I'm really, really tired and I'm like on the verge of falling asleep. I'm like, thank you, thank you, thank you. But really it's just like, thank you for that, I don't know, nice lady who was behind me in the store and had the extra two cents to give me that I was missing, you know, when I was came, coming to pay. Or, or thank you that, um, I don't know, the library had the book I wanted. Thank you that my kids liked my supper today. Thank you that supper didn't burn today. Just simple, simple things. And it's really the simplest things. We have so many of them. And they're the simplest things that make us the happiest. Um, and this really became a way of life for me. Because I told myself, life isn't perfect. Life is not a bed of roses, right? It's, there's, there are going to be things in my life. But I never want to find to come to a place in my life where I forgot what I learned here. I never want to come to a place in my life where I've taken things for granted. So I, I made it an effort. And I say thank you all the time. And we've done it to the point where we do this with our kids. Um, so I actually brought this here today. This is my daughter's. And um, each of my kids have them. I have two, two boys and a girl. And every night, right before bed, see, hers is already duct taped because it's two years old. We started this February 19, 2014. So it's almost two years. And every single night, um, we write the date. And we write three things that they want to thank Hashem for every single day. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's like she, she'll write, um, thank you, Hashem, because I went to the dentist. And now my teeth are sparkly and clean. I'm like, you thank Hashem for going to the dentist? Or, thank you Hashem, because my teacher did math today, and I love math. I'm like, are you my daughter? <laughs> you know. So one day, last week, is it last week? I gotta find this, because it's amazing. Oh yeah, this is last week. She writes, she's seven. She writes, I cannot believe how good my mother and father are to me. They are like precious stones in the world. Way to get so much better. And when I bury them, I will, make sure, I will make sure that mommy's stone will be purple and Tati's will be blue because gray is so boring. And this is, my, this is my seven year old. And this is the stuff they write every single day. Or thank you Hashem for my lovely family. 
I don't know, have I ever in my life thanked Hashem for my lovely family? <laughs> this is what they write. They're just, they love it. They, they're, and, if, and if a night like tonight and I had to leave early and they're not doing happy books, they cry. It's like, we didn't do happy books. And, and then if, if we miss the night or we don't end up doing it like Shabbos. So on Sunday, they feel like then they get to write six because they didn't do that. They, they love it. And they live this life of gratitude. And it's beautiful because they don't just do it with their books. They do it like... I'll make a supper and my kids will say, thank you, mommy, for making my favorite supper. Or my son told me the other day, thank you for making supper, even though I don't like it. Next time, can you make something else? But thank you for making supper. Or the most amazing, I'll be driving and I'll park and my kid will be like, thank you, Hashem, for giving us a parking spot. And I'm like, no, that's what I'm saying. But no, they're saying it. They, it. It became a lifestyle and it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And I can't wait for my daughter when she's... 15 or 20 to take this book and read it and see the things that she was thankful for in kindergarten and in pre-1A and in first grade. Um, one of the early ones in the book she wrote, she was probably in kindergarten at that time, and she wrote, Thank you, Hashem. I love the way you made me because every time I look in the mirror, I am so beautiful. <laughs> and I'm like, wait till the pimples come. I will show you. You are beautiful. You are amazing. You know what, you know what that does to a person when they live a life knowing? And, and um, at one point, so in, in my work, um, I, I'm a hypnotherapist, so I see clients, and my kids like to ask me about my, about my work. And um, obviously there's client confidentiality and stuff, but you know, they, they hear little details and stories here and there. So I remember once talking, and I wasn't even talking to them, I was talking to my husband, and I was saying that I had just seen um, a, young, a young woman, and she had a lot going on in her life. And she was really struggling in her amuna, and it was sad. She was a very, very brave person going through so much and I really admired her and respected her, but who can fault her? She was going through so much and she was having problems with her amuna. and my daughter overheard me and she says, what? How could she be angry at Hashem? Does she know what Hashem does for her every day? And I'm like, what does Hashem do for her every day? Like, let me hear you say it. He makes the sun shine. He makes colors. Imagine if our grass was blue. He made it green because it's so pretty. I'm like, who told you all this stuff? She's like, I just think about it. And, she, and she's very emotional, my kid. I think there's like tears running down her face. And she's like, I think about it and I know how much Hashem loves me because today purple is my favorite color and my mora wore something purple. And the whole day I looked at my mora and I was so happy and I said, thank you, Hashem, that my mora was wearing purple. And she says this in such seriousness. And I just look at her and say, that's amazing. That's amazing. Hashem should bless you that you should do this until 120. And actually, so this whole idea of, of like thankfulness is like really like a theme in our life. Um, so when I started and I told you that being here today is, is like really like the day. So today is Tash Shvat. And Vav Shvat, which was Shabbos, Vav Shvat was the day that they called me up and told me that I was in remission, that the chemo, I finished my fourth round of chemo, and then I had to go through all these testing rounds and stuff. And the testing was also, once if I passed all my tests, they were going to see if I was, um, because I was on a clinical trial, I was on a study, they were going to put me into like, like a randomization, into a computer, and the computer was going to decide if I should get radiation, which is the standard procedure, or if I should not get radiation, which was like something radical and new that they were only going to try with someone who had a full recovery of chemo. And so I had finished my fourth round, I had left the hospital, and they, they um, you know, and that was the day, the Vav Shvat was the day I left the hospital for the last time. Two weeks later, I found out that I would not need radiation and my whole parsha was over. But Vav Shvat was the last day I was in the hospital. It was the day I came out. So this was the Shabbos. So that makes being here today, like, beautiful. Like, like coming full circle, except that there's still more. So Tash Shvat, which is today, is the day my daughter was born. And today is her birthday. Today she turned seven. And when she was born... It's the Parsha of the week, it's Parsha's Peshalach, and it's a Parsha about giving Shira, saying thank you. And so we named her Bracha, because I just, saying thank you, the whole point of saying thank you is that life is a blessing. And you, you just, by saying thank you, you just never forget that. So she has another name, she's Hadassah, Hadassah Bracha, and, and, she, and she's so proud of it. She tells people all the time when their teachers are, are telling, you know, like, who are you named after, which grandmother, she's like, I'm not named after a grandmother. I am named after a day, like a time. Because when she was born, Tash Shvat, it was not only a, a calendar date, you know, that this was the week 
that things worked out for me. It was also exactly five years after I had finished. So for those of you who don't know, in the cancer world, five years, reaching that five year milestone is the day they actually consider you in remission. That was the day that if I was going to make a pseudos hoda, that was going to be my pseudos hoda. Because anything that happens within the first five years, you're kind of still on the like, you know, the danger zone, they watch you more carefully just in case anything happens. If chas v'shalom, anything happens within the first five years, it's not even called a relapse. It's just like part of the same, you know, it's, it's like the cancer never, they consider it as if the cancer never really went away. And, um, I'm sorry, it is called a relapse, but after five years, if nothing happened for five years, it's considered as if it's a brand new cancer, totally unrelated to the old one. So it was like amazing. It was my five-year date. It was that day that I was celebrating being healthy and, and a brand new person. And then we had this beautiful girl, Parsis Bashalach, like you couldn't get any better than that. And then to be called here today, and you know, we set this date already a month ago, and all of a sudden I'm looking at my calendar and I'm realizing, hey, wait, this is the day. It's like amazing. I'm like, thank you Hashem that I can stand here in front of an audience on a day like today and give this over to you. So, you know, lots of people unfortunately have been through what I've been through. It's not, it's not a, it's not uncommon these days. It's not new. But I, honestly, when I look back at what I went through, I don't, I don't see it as a bad time in my life. Nobody would want to choose to go through anything like that. I mean, of course not. But looking back at it, I don't, I don't, I don't see it as, as a bad thing. So many, so much good came out of it. It's like, I know it sounds crazy to say, but I'm thankful for it. I say, thank you, Hashem, that I had to go through this, but at least that now that I went through it, look what I got out of it. I got something beautiful. I got a life. I have happiness. I have true happiness before I had just humor. Now I have real true happiness. And not only that, I have gifts. You know what I have? I have sunshine, I have grass that's green, I have a sky that's blue, I have lungs that breathe, I can go to the bathroom, I have friends, I have such amazing things. So that's really when people ask me to speak and they ask me to share my experiences, you know, there's always this quality of like wanting to know, being curious, hearing someone else's um, experience. To me, it's not about a life story, it's not about my story, it's about what I learned, and this is what I learned. Gratitude. It's, it's the answer to everything. So that's, that's really the only message. If this, this happy book, we call them happy books. They're like, I give this to everybody. I just tell everybody, this is my, this is my answer to everybody. Take one of these. I do it in my head. My kids do it in a book. Really, I wish I did it in a book because at this point, if I had done it in a book, I would have 12 years worth of these to look through and say, wow, you know, thank you Hashem for, for everything. It's like, how can you not? How can you not love life? How can you not love Hashem? How can you not feel Hashem? How can you not know that He's there when you're so busy thanking Him all day? So, does anyone message? This is it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>